Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session of this conference. Um, we're going to commence the session with a keynote speech, and then we'll move on to the breakaways for the session five and session six. Um, so it gives me pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker from the United Kingdom, Dr. Sarah De Freitas. Um, Dr. Sarah is a leading international educator in university and school education settings. She's worked as a researcher, senior executive in UK and Australian universities, and an education executive and director of Way Education PLC. I'm going to summarize her bio, and the full bio is available on our website. She has published over 100 conference papers and journals, seven books, and led on 58 research and development projects, raising over 5 million in research and development funds from European and UK research councils. Her current work focuses on the implementation, on, sorry, on implementing the Learn, Explore, Apply, Reflect model at Interhigh and Academy 21, building a virtual campus and leading on quality and student engagement for around 4,000 students from the UK and overseas. Dr. Sarah, thank you very much for making time in your busy schedule to uh, present for us at this conference. And we were hoping to have you in person, but due to the pandemic, we're having it virtually and we hope that you will join us in future ses in future editions when it's face to face again. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Apasana, and, and thanks colleagues for joining us today as well, and to Apasana for, for the uh, excellent organization of uh, and as you know, organising uh, academics isn't always the easiest thing. So uh, somehow we managed to pull it all together. And um, I just really wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, a little bit about the journey. I guess we've all been on really, which is around the around the pandemic. And I, I have been looking at some of the research recently to um, to sort of pick out some of the highlights from from the research. So I'm just going to try and make sure that I share the screen properly with you. So I'll duplicate slides. So I think that should be it. Apasana, is that all looking okay from your angle? Yes, perfect, perfect. Um, so yes, yeah, so I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned from the pandemic and then introduce some of the sort of key concepts that have been really helpful for me in terms of driving my understanding around um, online, around blended, around learning design, and around some of the key elements that support really engaged student experiences. Just need to get that out of the screen so I can read what I'm doing. Brilliant. So, um, so that's sort of what I wanted to talk about today and, and a little bit about sort of, you know, what, what we can do differently as a result of the pandemic, you know, how can we engage more and, you know, sort of a little bit of an indication of where we're going next and then a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So I think we've got one hour in total. Is that right, Apasana? I'll try and um, keep the talk as, as, as brief as I can so that we can have some, some interaction as well, because I think that's quite important. So um, Apasana will give me, a, you know, some time checks, I think, from, from time to time. As well. um, yeah, that, that's fine, Prof. Um, yeah, an hour in total. So I'll try, and, yeah, I'll try and keep us as, as, as quick as we can on, on, on the uh, slides front. But I've got quite a few, so I'll, I'll probably just run through them a little bit. Um, there's a little bit of a skew towards children's education. And I know that um, many colleagues here today won't be from, from, from um, primary and secondary education, but I think a lot of the things that I've seen in primary and secondary education do seem to relate to the university lessons learned as well. Um, just a few sort of key facts there. I won't sort of read them through, um, but I think that one of the key things for me is really around just the amount of disruption that, that has been faced by school children and um, university children teachers, etc., all around the world, and how many students, 1.5 billion students, that had to pivot from, uh, from classroom, from physical teaching to online overnight. And it's an amazing, actually, uh, across the world, how that's been achieved and what's been achieved there. Um, but of course, there will be quite a big impact in terms of lost schooling. So we do in anticipate as educators that there will be further work to do to try and, and, and close up some of those gaps. And you know, some of the things that were coming out from the research, and I've just, I've just sort of um, characterised a few of the um, sort of lessons from teachers, actually, because I thought that was quite interesting to focus on what the teachers had learned. 
Um, and you know, the, this was quite a good study from the Education Development Trust in the UK, and it basically very much talked about the need for adaptive, agile um, uh, policy making. Um, it, it really looked at you know the, the importance around data and, and the, the importance of equity, and, and you know how that equity point hasn't always um, been as successful as we'd like it to be uh, from from uh, from a top level approach. And just I suppose the three that I really wanted to focus on were really those those orange bullet points there that you know that, that it's not just about great teaching and learning. There's also you know a lot more going on in terms of the students' well-being, in terms of the support needed for teachers in terms of the access to technology and of course the digital divide really was uh, one of the things that for me certainly sort of came out as, as one of the learnings and really this need to sort of think about digital pedagogy think about how we design learning in a digital context in a slightly different way but in a way that must be accessible and include that technology side but not be necessarily driven by that and I think the other thing that really came out for me and I was working in a school over the period, you know, was, was really that need to have more engagement with the parents, have greater engagement with, with the community as a result of, of, of the online mode. And I think that's something that you know, will be challenging as we go forward. Another group that did quite an interesting report was the International Council on Education for Teaching. Um, and they really sort of, again, it was the same sort of themes, you know, greater engagement of teachers needed in, in governance and, and in, in policy making. You know, some of the limitations with online, you know, what, what can we do to engage students more? Um, and overall, a really positive feeling from the teachers about the new skills and knowledge that they were learning through the period, and also the ongoing interest in how we might be able to adapt those methods as we go forward and come out of the, of the pandemic, which, you know, which, which by all accounts may take a little bit longer than we'd hoped for, and certainly we may see more disruption over the next few years. One of the areas where there was quite a lot of challenge was around teaching practical subjects that came up quite quite heavily in the research as well and you know particularly sort of subjects like art um, where you know where you need to have a bit more time together and where you know it's useful to have that that physical contact those were areas where you know sometimes um, the teachers were finding it more difficult to adapt to online and we've talked about the loss of learning and the increased dropout rates you know, the need for equity in terms of access to um, technology. These were the points that just came up. And of course, in, in the context of, uh, of South Africa, as well as the UK, it's, it's not just about the technology itself. It's also the connectivity and the uh, access to, to electricity, which have all been affected over the pandemic. So some of those sort of key elements that I sort of tried to pull together was, you know, around, you know, a diff different, different kinds of pedagogies the need to look at workload because that was really becoming a, a factor in terms of having to develop these online courses and deliver them and you know a lot going on at that time and it was exhausting I know for a lot of, a lot of teachers involved in that and a lot of the curriculum focused approaches were just weren't working so well online they were just a little bit boring so it was really much more about interaction you know breaking down the, the times doing a little bit more into work with the students and, and being able to do breakout sessions more um, and also, I think what was also shown to be quite fragile was the exam based approaches. So summative learning really sort of that that model almost sort of completely sort of broke apart over the period, which was interesting and, and something I know a lot of educators are, are quite keen on exploring as we go further forward. And I think also just the relationships changed, you know, teachers were becoming much more sort of central uh, to, to the to the relationships between the students. And of course, that in turn, that that sort of strangely more importance in a way of, of the teachers in terms of being able to communicate what was happening and what was going on to be able to link those communities together and to be able to engage with the families that was I think very very challenging as well and I think you know what we've been seeing in parallel is this trend towards greater uh, fears and, and greater mental health issues and I think that's something which we've seen however on the positive side I did find personally uh, you know online education I've always found this to be a real leveler so for, for students who've got disabilities or access issues or accessibility issues you know they really did enjoy it. well not when I say enjoy nobody enjoyed it but you know that they came out of it quite well and you could see that they were that they were faring well and the ones that you know some of the students had complained about bullying and other issues in school when they came into the online environment, they felt more secure, they felt safer. And I think that's quite an interesting outcome from, from, from this as well. The one that I quite liked was, you know, this nine ideas for public um, action from UNESCO was we can't return to the world as it was before. And I think that that's something that's, you know, hasn't really maybe quite sunk in. And I think it will take a bit of time for us as a, as a community to 
be able to understand the impacts and to be able to implement that into our practice as well. Um, but you know, some of these were some of the other points that came out from the UNESCO um, from the UNESCO um, report, uh, Education in the Post-COVID World, which is also very interesting and useful to look at. Um, and you know, I mean, I think broadly it was the same sorts of points uh, that were coming through in the other reports. Um, but I think also there was this sort of quite interesting area around social space and how we use social spaces to support and transform education as well. And of course, there was a little bit more about the um, CPD and how we can support teachers going forward. So these are the sorts of things that I sort of really noticed when I was um, a school head headmistress, which was not on my career path because I've got an academic background. I've been 25 years in university, so I wasn't really expecting to leave a school. But you know, these were sorts of uh, lessons that I, I sort of picked out. So. Yeah, the, the, the ability I thought was so, so interesting was the ability to change delivery modes um, like that, to pivot like that, I thought was really impressive and, and I really enjoyed that. I liked the fact that it was a level playing field for all students and students were doing really well um, online and, and, and thriving on, online and I, I really enjoyed being part of that, that was, that was great. Um, and of course, you know, we've been talking about this for 25, 30 years, but ongoing CPD and training is required and we need to keep that moving. But in parallel, we need to look at learning design and, and, and consider learning design in, in a more um, scientific way, perhaps, and to look at that IT support and see how that wraps together. And I know in some larger universities, we can afford these quite large teaching and learning units, but in other universities, obviously, that are smaller, uh, we don't have so much capacity to do that. So really getting that balance right for that organisation is important. I think also for me, there was a lot around curriculum because I was looking at the curriculum at the time and I was trying to sort of make an understanding of it. And I've been talking about the bloated curriculum, um, which actually colleagues found really, um, they liked it actually when I did, did this. Uh, this is the only the second time I've delivered this talk, a sort of adaption of this talk. And I sort of trialed it out last week or a couple of weeks ago at Kingston University. And they really like that idea of the bloated curriculum. And for me, it was, you know, there's just no space. You know, when you've got a bloated curriculum, there's no space for getting a better balance between knowledge, skills, personal and social. And I think for me, that's a key learning. You know, how do we de-emphasize to some extent the knowledge, pull out the, the skills more, but then introduce a much greater capability for personal and social development as well. So through personal, personal tuition, through you know, peer assisted learning and so on. So trying to get a, balance, a balanced curriculum and a, a less bloated curriculum is, is something that really stood out for me. And of course, we know that there's a real fragility there around mental health. And we know from the Gen Z who've been born after 1995, much larger numbers are suffering from mental health issues. So the need for personal tuition, the need for very, very regular one to one support is, is clearly there and it, it's needed um, on a level I think we, we haven't experienced previously in the university. So that's going to be a challenge. And then looking at that idea around the digital divide, I really liked the uh, the example um, in one of the reports, which was about Australia and how since the 1950s, actually, they've been developing these schools of the air to make sure that education can reach remote areas. And in fact, I work with Martin, Martin Dukiamis and, and uh, at Curtin University, which is where he came from, and he developed uh, Moodle. And one of the reasons he developed Moodle was because he was, you know, he, he himself grew up in, in the outback with lots of Aboriginal students and he understood the difficulty of uh, delivering education out there. So he developed um, Moodle as a result of that. So, you know, that how we find you know, creative solutions to support all of our students, because it's not fair if some students are receiving uh, education and some are not able to. So that has to be corrected um, and we know that. I think the workload issue is probably more difficult. I think that needs to be addressed at a sort of policy level and a government level, as well as at a, at a local level. But it certainly was something which was upsetting teachers and, and it needs to be addressed for sure. So just to sort of summarise this segment of the talk then, sort of just some of the lessons from the research and from my own observations. I think, you know, for me, one of the key things is how important it is for educators to be engaged in the decision making and the, the curriculum programmes at all levels. You know, I think there shouldn't be a level that we're not involved when it comes to um, developing the systems, when it comes to designing the policy and the governments that supports that. Also, the, the need for upskilling is, is more significant than even I think we probably realised before, so that we need to put in proper training and adequate support for the teachers to deliver what they need to deliver. And also we need the right skills training. So I know there's quite a lot of study, uh, quite a lot of courses out there, but I think you know, they need to be giving and delivering the right skills uh, that, that are needed. 
For students, I think the need for greater engagement in, in online and interaction with teachers and student groups really came out strongly in the literature. Um, clearly, students love working in the online, but they need to feel engaged. So, you know, the same methods we use in the classroom are not, are not going to work in, in online context. context. Um, but if we can blend them together, if we can bring them together, you know, we can start to see, you know, the power of, of both. So what did I learn? So I had sort of two, I suppose, major um, uh, sort of uh, moments of, uh, of clarity. And one was really around, you know, what, what the curriculum means, what the, what the delivery of the curriculum means. And the other was how we had now to look to the next step, which was not physical, it was not digital, it was blended and it was virtual as well. So really sort of slightly changing and twisting how we look at things in the future. So I want to talk a little bit about that future. So just as a sort of point of context, then um, society has changed as a result of the digital revolution. And undeniably, that is the case. And we've seen different changes in different sectors. Now, what's happened in the I believe what's happened in the education sector is it's been a quiet revolution. And a lot of that revolution has been happening from the grassroots. And I think a lot of it has been happening from the students themselves. I think there's been a very strong drive from from this amazing group of students who've been born after 95. The Gen Zs, as we call them, they are very techy. They have lots of different devices. They are watching mobile video. They have learning preferences that really focus around access to information. Uh, that that focus on um, uh, what what can that information do for me? How can I you know how can I make make understanding of that information and and manipulate that and understand that to support the way that I learn and the way they learn is much more experientially. And how can we take stress away from the students? Because you know, clearly there's a lot of students reporting, about one in three reporting stress. Um, many have anxiety and depression, and some have more serious issues as well. So you know, we've got a very significant um, pressure there to, to get the, the mental health side of what we do right. So sort of three main trends, I would say there. So what I've tried to do is to try and look at how we can start to adapt what we do more closely to what is needed. And one of the things that's come out in the research was quite interesting. University of Peking, Beijing University research said that 15 to 20, 30 minutes is best for digital lessons with regular breaks and changes of gear. So that's something that, again, that's going to impact how we deliver what we deliver. The hybrid model works really well. If we can mix it up, if we can use different media, if we can use different channels, we know that's working really well and it's really helping our students as well. And, you know, sort of where we're going, I think project based learning is quite a good model for learning, because although all learning might not be project based in the future, certainly it gives you a sort of idea of what sort of the level of interactivity that the students will need. And that doesn't mean more work, by the way, for teachers and, and lecturers, but that, that actually can mean less work in a way. But it's a different kind of approach. And it's more for me about choreographing learning experiences than simply delivering content. So for me, that's a really quite a critical point of how, how do we make learning more engaging? You know, what elements can we use? And of course, through the pandemic, we've seen this amazing growth of very different kinds of approaches. So virtual labs, more use of breakout sessions, project-based project learning, rewards, games, simulations, quizzes, show and tell. I mean, I've seen a lot of creativity coming into teaching over the period, and I hope that we can start to pull some of that innovation and, and, and creativity and amazing um, ideas that the teachers and the students are having and you know put that into a model that, that is meaningful to us going forward. So I wanted to talk just quite quickly, I don't know how we're doing time, but I just want to talk quite quickly about this model. I'm not going to talk in any depth because I know that we you know we're trying to move through quite a bit of content here. But basically, the idea for me is that we've gone through three phases or, or three elements. Now, they inter they, they're not clean and they, they mix together, but we've sort of seen this move from the traditional paradigm, which is something that we're all very familiar with, age and stage, tutor led, curriculum based and so on, text based to new learning paradigm. So this is something John Dewey talked about in his work, New, new Learning. I've talked about actually in my last book as well. It's quite an interesting concept. But it's really much more about being active and actively engaged. So active learning, we, we talk about, we talk about peer focused, um, much more adaptable in terms of time and when we can release that. 
Um, and really that sort of that line along formative assessment to peer assessment and so on and moving through into competency and uh, personalized learning. So personalized learning, I think, is quite an important uh, trend that we're on. And we can talk about that a bit more later as well, if I can move through and, and get to questions which I want to. Um, and then, of course, multimedia, new, new curriculum and work readiness. You know, these are all things that have been associated with new learning. I think we're moving into we're actually phasing quite quickly into future learning. And this is because this quiet revolution that I talk about has been going on for 50 years since the 1970s. This revolution has been in progress. It hasn't been a big woo. It's a revolution. It's going to change everything in one day. But things have been changing quite significantly as we've gone through. And for me, future learning is sort of where we need to be sort of thinking about now. So for me, this means student developed pedagogy. So this means student led learning. It means student voice. It means all the things that we think about with students. But I actually think students can get much more actively involved in learning. And I've run some projects in universities uh, looking at peer assisted learning and the past program I think most of you will be familiar with, which is uh, supplemental instruction, is a fantastic model for peer learning where students in the year above will be supporting students in the year below. So I do recommend if your university isn't using that at the moment, do have, have a good look at that. Uh, the other area is around scaffolded learning. Now, it's interesting because one of my PhD students, um, he works in an AI research lab and he's informed me with lots of certainty that teachers and, and lecturers, we're in the, the unique group that cannot be replaced by AI, according to him. So I don't know how long that will last for, but obviously that's quite good news. Um, but of course, AI can be used for a lot of other things. And I think where it can it could work really well is scaffolding the learning of the students. So going back to this idea around uh, personalized learning, you know, how we support that learner through their uh, through their individual study. This is something where, you know, AI can be used. And there's a lot of other areas where AI could be used to support, you know, um, recommender style education. So if you're putting different modules to a student, for example, you know, AI can help to support, oh, well, you know, they've got problems in this area, we need to give them more information there. So that's the sort of way that I think that will start to work. And, you know, I think we'll start to see that future learning piece sort of, you know, we'll, we'll start to see it already starting to, to come into to what we do. Seamless like lifelong learning, now I know we've been talking about this for a very long time. I do think this is deliverable. Um, and I think it's deliverable within the digital learning context and within personalized learning in particular, because you know, we do need to upskill. We, we're learning constantly. The idea that we, you know, we learn there and then we stop learning and then we do is, is obviously, I think, as everyone, uh, every educator probably would agree with me on that, you know, it, it's ongoing. And the other area where I think we're going to see big changes is really around assessment. We've already talked about some of the fragilities of the uh, summative um, examination system. I think we're going to see almost, um, the way I see it is it's going to be much more like game-based learning. So I think there'll be leveling up and there'll be points and awards and there'll be all kinds of motivations, but they won't necessarily be summative testing because for us, we don't, getting information about the student through their whole year is going to be much more valuable to us than knowing how they felt on that day mm -hmm. at the end of the year. So I think that I'm, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in that space going forward. Um, I talk about unique learning patterns. I'm not completely sure what these are, um, but I think they're things that are uh, almost an extension of personalized learning and, and try to take some of that thinking around personalized learning, build that into our own understanding and being able to use technology to adapt to those different learning approaches, I think is going to be quite powerful. And I think from the teacher's point of view, it's going to lead to quite a lot of creativity in terms of how we teach on an individual basis. So I think that's, I, I'm quite excited about that. Adaptive learning, um, again, it's a term that I'm using quite loosely probably at the moment, but you know, it means different channels to me. So you know, different media channels, so whether that's video, whether we're using games, simulations, virtual labs, you know, and all the other wonderful things, you know, how we bring those together, how do we adapt those so that the student can really learn and, and really be excited about learning. Um, and for me, go back to curriculum, I like to, I'd like to see the, the a hidden, a hid, not a hidden curriculum, that's probably not the right word because that has, um, that has uh, other meanings, I understand, but a, a more embedded, I think that's probably a better word, embedded curriculum, uh, which allows us to support um, learning in terms of skills, knowledge, personal and social that we talked about earlier. And then blending, so that blend between work and learning, it's going to become much more blurred, that line between work and learning. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of opportunities there for us to, to support um, quite exciting uh, programmes of work. I'm just trying to yeah, click forward. So 
coming out of that so that's sort of like I wanted to give you sort of like a bit of a high level of you know sort of where I think because I, I just think it makes it a lot easier if you know where you're from what you're doing now and where you're going to and I think that that really helps to give you a little bit of a spine of understanding and for me it's really coming back down to this idea around physical digital and virtual and of course all of that together which is blended and I think for me this is our our, our, our playground now as teachers and, and as learning designers and as, as lecturers you know, how do we design experiences um, that are going to be able to hit between physical, digital and virtual spaces and bring it together into something really meaningful and really um, exciting for our students. I'm not going to talk to this too much, but I just wanted to sort of show a little bit of the thinking about how I've split out physical, digital and uh, virtual just to give you a little bit of a flavour. Uh, but I won't really talk to this, uh, to this slide too much. But if people do have questions, you know, do email me later. Um, and I've got books and, and lots of papers that can, can help as well with that. But I did want to talk a little bit about the Lear model, which Abbasana did sort of um, briefly sort of um, uh, indicate, because I think this is quite, um, this is quite an exciting um, model. So this model really comes straight out of the work that I've done previously. So um, in the past, I developed a model called the exploratory learning model, and this was really a model which took Kolb's experiential learning model and it added an exploration model into that model. I haven't got a graph today to show you, but, uh, but, but that's basically what, where the model comes from. And then when I went to Way Education, so this was my first school that I'd worked in, they had already developed something called the lead and follow model. But for me, lead and follow really felt very teacher focused. So I really wanted to flip that over and make it much more student focused. So I went with learn and explore. And then I really wanted to, I felt that that model had to go further. So I added apply and reflect in there. And it just seemed to really, everything just sort of, you know, how those things happen sometimes. It just, everything just snapped together and it just, it just really felt right. And then what I tried to do, and I'm not sure if you can see that slide, I can't quite see it because it's got something in front of it, but uh, I wanted to sort of split it out into teaching mode. So teaching, guide, mentor, and um, uh, I can't, yeah, coach. That's the one. Coach was the one at the end. So I just I just tried to sort of like break that model out um, in that way. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to then sort of map the curriculum back against that model. So I'll, I'll sort of show you a little bit my thinking around that. But just while I've got this slide up, just also to sort of start thinking, and it's probably not quite the same in the university context as in the school context, but this idea of trying to wrap together, this thinking does come from university um, experience, but to try to wrap together the curricula, the co-curricula and the extracurricular, and to try and find a bit more space to bring in to support the personal development and the social development of the students as well. So that's sort of how I try to sort of break out that, that model that way. Um, I'm not gonna talk about engagement. Much. How, how are we doing for time, Apasana? If you're there. I hope you can hear me. Um, but where I wanted to go, so there's a bit on engagement there. I just wanted to just quickly show you this video, which hasn't got sound on it, but it just sort of shows how you can sort of pull out that model and you can try and you know sort of feed in different levels of delivery so whether that's learn when you're you know you're delivering on a on a sort of a lecturer level or whether you're delivering in terms of seminars and apply in terms of how you're delivering that assessment piece so whether you're doing activities how that's actually fitting together and then bringing in that reflect so there's one-to-one -one sessions with the tutor and the student so that you can sort of start to, to pull all those elements of the learning uh, experience back together. So that was sort of just a little bit around the model, I think it's quite handy to know. Um, and then just to sort of, just to sort of show that, sort of break that out a little bit further. So our model at Way was really a live, uh, live model, um, live lesson model. So that was really the prim primary way that we were delivering the learning and we were looking at different curricula very student focused and also alternative provision which is students who've been uh, you know, WP students or widely participation students or students with disabilities and so on so um, that was sort of how I broke that out and then into explore you know you're going into the idea you're, you're looking at that idea within that whether that's the tutorials and the, and the seminars whether that's in a virtual context or not but then you've also got that time when the student can be learning independently through virtual campuses virtual labs virtual field trips simulations games and so on so it's really trying to sort of almost 
pull out that the time of the school day or the time of the of the students day and look at how that can be re re-aggregated in the light of, of where we are and it was the same with apply so you know we need to assess but people don't want to feel assessed you know they want to feel that that's you know it's a way that they're actually taking the knowledge they're applying the knowledge obviously that's being tested and we're looking at that but that isn't a central driver for learning you know that, that exploration is still uh, the main focus for, for learning and uh, similarly in the reflect space you know finding the model that works you know whether that's one-to-one -one sessions which really work the best you know how often the frequency of that you know the expense of that model as well and how we can actually make that model work and then i just try to sort of just show it in terms of how it works with what i've called a flipped plus model um so i don't know whether that name will stick or whether we'll just be calling it the layer model but it, it's sort of uh, trying to sort of show how you know again the resources aren't necessarily where you want to put the face-to-face -face time you know the resources will, is something that they can do in, in a different time zone so that was sort of i'm not sure how we're doing for time i don't know if anyone's got a time check for me you're so fine oh, you're fine oh, excellent. you're fine another 10 10 12 minutes is fine thank you oh excellent so i did want to get to uh, questions um so just sort of some, some conclusions then just to draw through some of the things we've said. I, I realise I've, I've covered quite a bit of territory there. Um, but I think just to sort of pull it back together, you know, I think we are in a different world. You know, the pandemic has happened. You know, we have uh, pivoted to online. You know, we, we, you know we, we know the fragilities of our systems now. And we know what's good about them. I think going forward, innovation and adaptation is going to be key because it is going to be a period where we look at the models, we look at the delivery of that, and we try to sort of pull that back together. Um, I also think that the evidence base shows some quite big similarities between different sectors in education, which I think is quite interesting because then we can start to look at those breaks between school and, and, and university, for example, where students are struggling a little bit more and just try to see whether we can't just bring those elements of, of the curriculum and of the learning experience together in a more beautiful way, let's say. Um, there's always a need for, for, for more CPD training. Uh, in my previous job, we developed a course, actually a level four course for teachers to teach online. And it was actually a very interesting process to go through. Uh, but there needs to be more directed um, CPD for online education. Um, and also, I think that the other bit is, you know, there is an expectation almost that, oh, well, teachers can do it all. But I think, you know, there needs to be an understanding at the organisational level that, you know, investment is needed here. You know, we need learning designers, we need uh, technical support, we need people who can deliver the training. You know, so there is a there is an overhead to this. So so additional uh, investment is needed. Um, and then really students need to they need to feel that they're in you know, a navigable learning experience for them. So you know, when they're moving between different channels, whether that's virtual and digital or face to face or blending those, there needs to be some sort of signal around that. You know, what are they doing? Why are they doing it? You know, why are we doing this? You know, so a little bit of thinking around what's the narrative that holds all these elements together or you know, what's the narrative that holds that experience together? I think that's going to be where, where we're going to start um, to put our brains in terms of learning design. And then just that last point really around uh, pedagogy, you know, I think most people realise that and recognise that it has changed but because it's been changing over such a, such a long period of time. Um, I think that sometimes we don't notice things that are in front of us um, as educators. And I think one of the things for me is how much we've achieved, you know, how much we've achieved over the last 20, 30, well, certainly since the 70s, in terms of changes to curriculum, changes to delivery, you know, changes in lots of areas of practice. I think that there is this feeling that, you know, we're stuck or we haven't moved anywhere, but I don't think that's the right place to be. And that's not the right way, way to think about it. I think the right way to think about it is, you know, it's been an amazing journey and we've gone really far, but we've still got some things to balance out because for the generation coming through, having a big focus on knowledge and not looking at skills and not looking at personal and social, you know, that's not going to chime with them. So how we how we maximize the personalized experience for the student is going to be at the center of what we do. So that was sort of everything that I wanted to say from the sort of from the slides point of view. But of course, you know, there's a lot of questions in there for me. I'm sure there's a lot of questions for you. So I'd be very excited to hear what your feedback is and what your experiences have been and, and um, your questions. Thank you.